Sometimes a story is shared with me, and I just think to myself, wow, this is true horror. It's horror because it could so easily be real. There are so many stories out there which are exactly like this, and have actually happened. So my dear friends, listen to this one carefully this evening, contemplate it, and let me know what you think. Not particularly gruesome, but sad and horrific in its own way. Looking forward to many comments on this one. So, sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear, dear friends, because it's time to listen. I've been interviewing and collecting stories for a possible true crime book regarding the dangers of the internet. Here is one of those stories. Some information was changed for anonymity purposes. I'd worked with Sheila for about three years when this happened. Sheila was a widowed 53-year-old mum of two. Her kids were grown and lived out of state with their own children when this happened. Sheila got a home computer and, having heard several people talk about it, she decided to get back in the game by signing up for a few dating sites. Now, let me preface this just a little more. Sheila was attractive enough. Not ugly, not pretty, just average, I would say. However, since her husband died, she'd felt fat, unworthy of love and ugly. Silly to me, but hey, who am I to judge? Anyway, within a few days of signing up, Sheila received several messages. Many from men just like her. Hardworking, average looks with middle-class lives. Many of them, for whatever reason, were not looking what she was looking for. Sheila and I were pretty good friends, so one night while at home, she sent me an email with a link to the profile of the newest of her would-be online suitors. The instant I saw his profile, I thought, whoa, out of her league. He said he was 21 years younger than Sheila. He was strapping, good-looking, muscular, and wealthy. He graduated from Oxford University, owned an architecture firm, and traveled all over the world. I didn't want to hurt my friend or discourage her, so I just replied, Heck yeah, he looks great. <laughs> Wish a guy like that was interested in me. The next morning at work we giggled and talked about the new man in Sheila's life. Again, I didn't want to hurt her, but something just did not feel right to me. She printed off some of the emails they'd exchanged. Here's a sample, well, for whatever reason. I held on to them. Kensington Brad. Hi, pretty woman. I like to see your smile in my face. It makes me happy the day I can see it in the flesh. You so pretty, like a flower grown in my yard. Sheila. <laughs> You're so sweet. Thanks. I appreciate your compliments. Kensington. No complimenting, just truth from my lips. Where you stay? Do you have work to go to? What things occupy you? You have little ones running at your feet. Sheila. Thanks again. You have such a nice face. You are very handsome. I do not have little ones running at my feet. <laughs> By the way, it sounds funny when you say it in that way. But yes, I have children. They are grown with their own families and live in Maryland and Oregon. I don't get to see them much. I have some health problems, so don't travel very often. I would like to, though. Anyway, I do work. I work for a group of healthcare providers as a manager. As for what occupies my time, well, I see movies, mostly on Netflix. Going to the movies alone is, well, lonely. I like to read romance books, watch TV, play games on the computer and go shopping and out to eat with my girlfriends. What about you? Kensington. 
I work so much, I have no minutes for the fun stuff. I still cannot believe I am so lucky that a woman with beauty would talk to me. Sheila. <laughs> I don't mean to pry, but your way of writing is unique. Where were you raised? Your profile says you live in New York. That's a bit far for me, as far as dating someone. But I do like having a friend to come home and talk to. Kensington. I was raised in France, but moved to US of A when I went to university. I do live in New York, but you are not far for me to travel to see my flower. I can come to you. You, like many women's, love the shopping? I will take you to favorite store and buy you what you desire. Sheila. <laughs> As for you, you are handsome. I don't know why you'd want someone like me. And you don't have to buy me anything. Please, just be my friend. As I stated, I do get lonely. Kensington. Please, write to me your phone number. Sheila replied, but I'm leaving out her phone number for the sake of this story. Kensington. Thanks, my sweet love. I will call to you on tomorrow. What times can I call, my love? Sheila. Any time after 6 p.m. Talk to you then. Looking forward to it. Kensington. Me too, a sweet love. That was one of their first few exchanges. Sheila was over the moon when she came back to work the day after they spoke on the phone for the first time. She told me all about how he was in Amsterdam working on a project for a university to build a theatre designed by him. She told me how he drives a Corvette, and how much fun it would be to ride along the beach in a fast sports car. Something her very practical husband never would have done. She had a glow I had never seen about her before. She told me that for all the love she'd had for her husband, she'd always wished he was more spontaneous, and wanted more fun in life. Upon his death, Sheila was left with a large amount of money. I don't know the exact amount, but my rough calculations place it over $200,000. Most of all, she'd been so practical her whole life. I don't think she knew how not to come to work. Sheila continued to work because she didn't like always being alone. And she was terribly alone, or so she felt. She once told me that she just came to work to hang out with me. Now, I love me some Sheila. We were as close as two people, so different in age could possibly be. A laugh is the best. It can bring a smile to anyone's face. So animated when she talks, it makes for great conversation. Soon after, she started talking to this so-called Kensington guy. He sent flowers, perfume, chocolates, letters. He did all of the romantic things most women want. Still, I wasn't convinced, not to mention appalled, that she would give him her address. Yet she said she could trust him. Anyway, as I said, Sheila was head over heels. Every day she came to work walking on air. I'd never seen her so happy. Hell, I was a newlywed and I wasn't that happy. Still. No matter how excited she was, I was not so sure about this guy. Even though I'd heard some stories, this was a few years before catfishing and the like were widely spoken about anywhere. So, even though I was suspicious, I wasn't positive. I told her just to slow down and not make any commitments until she spent some time in person with him. He'd be in town the following week and she could decide what to do then. I told her. Sheila had booked a hotel room for him. He didn't feel it would be proper to stay at her house, since they were just meeting. He wanted to be a gentleman, he assured her. Sheila and I went shopping for a new outfit. She got her hair done the whole nine yards. I offered to go pick him up at the airport with her, but she didn't want me to go. The day finally came, a Friday. 
so she'd taken that Friday and Monday off to spend time with him. I told her to call me as soon as she got home from the airport. Fast forward. Sheila was to pick him up at 4pm. I knew she'd probably call about 6. When I didn't hear from her by 6.30, I called her. It went straight to voicemail. I called again, and then again. I was starting to panic. I was about to drive the route to the airport when she finally called around 9pm. She was sobbing, but home safe. I told my husband I needed to go be with her and headed to her house. She was red-faced, still sobbing when I got there about half an hour later. She told me that the guy was being held by immigration in Amsterdam and had tried to work with the officials to convince them to let him go on the plane, but to no avail. He'd put his money in a carry-on bag, which they'd confiscated. Without his bag, he had no money, no ID, and they would not let him on the plane. His business associates had been kind enough to put him up and pay off the officials. But now, with no credit cards, ID, or nothing, he had no idea how he would manage. It sounded far-fetched to me. But I knew nothing about immigration or travelling through Amsterdam. But what I did know is that it didn't sound right. My suspicions were raised once again. <sighs> but I knew it would be okay, because now this guy would be out of her life. Finally. I was so happy. But the look on her face told me it wasn't over. A few days later, he stated that his business associates had bailed him out of the trouble. But now they were holding the money they owed him until he paid back what he owed them. Sheila suggested they take it out of the money they owed him. He said they do things differently there, and he would need to pay them first. Now, he previously told her his brother was a missionary. He stated that his brother, who was on a missionary trip in Ghana, was coming to get him. He suggested if she could just send the money to the brother... He could pick it up, and when he arrived back in the US, he would pay her back. So, she sent his brother in Ghana $3,700. Oh, a lump rose in my throat. I knew she was being misled, but I didn't know if I could convince her this didn't make sense. Night after night, he wooed her with sweet words. Here's another sample of the messages they exchanged via the internet. Yeah, this gives a better picture than just me explaining. Kensington. Hello, my beautiful bride. I send sweet kisses across the ocean to land on your beautiful cheeks and lovely lips. To hold you in my arms is what I awake thinking of, and the tender words you speak are the song I fall asleep to. I am so excited for the day I can call you bride. I wait for the day we are family. Since the losing of my first wife and son, all I have wanted is to be family with someone. You are her. My real family. Good night, my love. Your protector, lover, husband. <sighs> And the crap just went on and on like that. About a month after the immigration incident, he fell very ill and once again had to cancel a trip to see her. She was, once again, devastated. He revealed to her during the chaos they did not take health insurance, so he'd had to pay cash. He said he still had no credit cards from when they were lost during the confiscation of his bag at the airport. Now, he had no money for doctors and hospitals. She asked so many questions, and, which he always had, well, what sounded to her, like a reasonable explanation for. They sounded like bullshit to me, but she wouldn't hear of it. In this unfortunate set of circumstances, he needed to have his gallbladder out, and his brother was coming to help him. If only he had $7,000 for the operation... If he didn't have the operation, he might die. <sighs> Working for a medical group, 
You think she might be smart this time? Nope, not so much. She sent him the money to his brother. For about a week, she heard nothing from him. Well, of course, he was recovering from surgery, so that's why he didn't call. Inward, my eyes rolled when she said this. I smiled and gave her a pat on the back. I'm sorry, I said. Nothing else to say. Sheila began to put distance between us, and our friendship barely existed outside of work. I remained steadfast, never losing sight of the friend I knew would soon need me. She would need me when she found out this guy wasn't who he said he was. <sighs> Situations like the hospital one happened again, and again, and again. Each time something different. Oh, one night he caught saying some money he'd sent to her was now missing from the Western Union system, and it would take 30 days for them to reimburse the claim. He said it was all the extra money he had. He told Sheila he would have no money for food or hotel expenses. He pleaded for her to return the money. She didn't even get the money he'd sent. Sheila finally stood up to him and said she didn't have any more money. He got infuriated and hung up on her. About twenty minutes later, she received this email. She forwarded it to me because she was so upset. Here is what it said. Sheila, I thought you loved me. No? No love for me. You want me to starve in streets. You want me to die. Fine, bitch. I will die of hunger in the street. No room to stay in. I will die. But I will make sure. I hurt you and your family before I die. I know people who will come to you. They kill because I say to. You will die, bitch. Hate me? Will I hate you? You will soon see. Die, bitch. Sheila's reply. Oh, please don't say those things to me, my love. You are the heart inside of me. I love you more than anyone. Please, don't call me names. It hurts me and makes you think you will be mean when we are married. Please, my love, forgive me. I love you so much. I will send you the $2,000 plus an extra 200 in case of any other things that might happen. Please, my love, I will send the money tomorrow morning when the bank opens. And so, she did. I was actually beginning to dislike my friend. First of all, and this might sound selfish, my husband and I were really having hard times financially, and she'd never offered us any help. Selfish, yes, but it did hurt to see us struggling while she sent thousands to a man she'd never even met. I was angry at how stupid she'd become. I was angry at the money she made because of her husband's death was being spent on some strange man. I was angry at everything. Most of all, I was angry at the fact that this woman I loved and respected had turned into a mindless idiot. One day at lunch, she leaned in as if telling me a secret. I'm putting in my notice. What notice? I asked. Two weeks here at this dump of an office. I'm quitting. I was actually happy, thinking she'd come to her senses and would get out of here and do the thing she'd dreamed of. <laughs> really? That's great. I mean, I'll miss you, but I'm glad you're going to get out of here and enjoy life. Yeah. I'm going on a mission trip with Kensington and his brother. We're all going to Ghana. My heart dropped and then race like a hummingbird's wings. <laughs> Ghana, you've never even met him, Sheila. I don't know if this is a good idea. Have you told your kids? Are you sure you're up to such a trip? This doesn't sound great, Sheila. Hell no, I haven't talked to my kids about it. They try to stop me and I want to live and learn to love again. As for traveling, he's going to help me. Sheila. I'm not sure this is love, 
Has he ever paid you the money he owes you? No, but husbands don't pay back their wives, silly. He's not your husband. You'll see. She picked up her food, dumped it in the trash, and walked out. A few weeks later, I was at her house helping her pack, while still trying to talk her out of this. Well, she went. She left me the key to her house, told me where all of her important documents were, placed me as an authorized user of her bank account in case of emergency, and I, being the stupid idiot I am, drove her to the airport. She called me when she got there. She sent pictures of her with this man. Hmm. Not a 30-something Brad Pitt, but a 22-year-old Ghana resident who worked at a cafe. You guessed it. An internet cafe. In the pictures, she was smiling, but it was not that over-the-moon smile she'd left with. No. It was forced. Before she left, Sheila and I had made up a danger phrase. When she used this phrase, it would mean that something was there that had put her in danger. I'd tried to research this missions group she was going to travel with and help, but I could not find any internet presence on them. She said it was a small group and they didn't want to waste money on websites, but they were sponsored by a very famous evangelist. I started to feel really scared when I called the evangelist headquarters and his people said they were in no way connected to this organization. In fact, they'd never heard of them. I was terrified now. But I'd talked to her just a few days before and she hadn't used the phrase. just seemed a little off from her normal personality. Sheila had been gone about six weeks when I got a call from her. My blood ran cold when she said, Jason's doing great. Just talk to him. That was the phrase, the I'm in danger phrase. She hung up a few minutes later. I still had no idea of her exact location. Her IP address changed all the time and she had called from a different number almost every time, too. I knew it wasn't my business, but I went to the bank and asked for a printout of that month's transactions. In all, Sheila had taken out $12,000. She soon called and asked me to withdraw $3,200, and Western Union it to some person I'd never heard of. When asked why I couldn't send it to her, she seemed weird and blew me off, and demanded that I send it. I was scared not to. I knew she was in trouble, so I did it. After I sent the money from her account, I called the FBI, and they gave me about a thousand people to talk to, and no one could help me. I called the embassy. They seemed uninterested too. No one could help me find Sheila. Now, I hadn't heard from her in over a week. I continued to try and get help, but again, this was before scams were all over the internet, and the government started to put manpower into cracking down on it. I don't think the feds had a clear grasp on what was really happening on the internet dating sites. To this day, there are no real laws to protect women, especially when they have handed over the money of their own free will. She left for her missions trip five years ago. The last time she called? Four years ago. By then, she'd withdrawn all but $72. The bank finally closed the account for lack of activity. I haven't heard from Sheila in four years. A few emails written by Kensington or one of his crew, but nothing from her. I know she didn't send the email because it sounded nothing like her. Five years later, we still pray we will one day see Sheila's beautiful face again. But I fear we won't. 
I like to believe she fell so much in love, she didn't want us to ruin things. But I know that isn't true. I know Sheila is dead, and we will never be able to give her a proper goodbye. I tell this story to warn people. I know many YouTube viewers, like this channel, might be younger, more aware individuals, but there are a million ways to lure you in. Many women are naively drawn into these scams. They are drawn in from loneliness, desperation, grief, any number of things. No matter how young you are, how savvy you think you are, these people make manipulation their full-time job. They will learn your Achilles heel and they will use it. This isn't about a catfish that is a 40-year-old guy in Nebraska. Instead, a big-time musician in LA that's 23. It's not about some pervy old guy looking for young girls. This is about people of all ages. Men are no exception. There are women around the world doing this to men, too. Since I began trying to find Sheila, I've met lots of people who have stories but were lucky enough to escape the situation before leaving to meet one of these creeps. So, please, listen. This is about your life and the life of your loved ones. Please be careful who you trust. I don't want to hear of any more Sheila. So, another one from Dr. Creepin's vault there. The subreddit I set up so that people could share stories with me for me to read with you. Now, I normally ask the authors to let me know if it's a true story or if it's fiction. In this case, Tiffany360 didn't say. And that makes this all the scarier. This reads like a true story and could very easily be so. And if it's a fictionalized account, then... It's one of a story which is sadly all too often true. Well, as you can tell, this one's had quite an effect on me. Um, any comments below? Much appreciated. I'll do my best, as ever, to reply to as many as I can. You all stay safe out there. Be back on Monday with another story for you. Have a great weekend, everyone. For now, bye-bye.